Um, I saw a study the other day that uh, was a study on um, the human brain, but specifically about anxiety and um, what the mind will, uh, will actually do when we start to worry and fear. And your mind will naturally go to the worst case scenario, which Correct. is what creates that anxiety even further. So, which is illogical, but, but it, it's the way we're designed as humans is for that fight or flight mentality. And so it has to go to that to prepare us. But what that can do in the stock market with your investments or even your financial plan is it can cause you to make illogical uh, decisions. So um, let me share again and I will hop in. You know, I got to have uh, some slides here. So. Um, so I just want to add that er all, everyone in our audience is now calm. They're good. They're in the right mindset because <laughs> they're about to receive all this data with you. That's right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> For your uh, Zen voice there, Anna. Appreciate Thank that. you. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm transferring from Zen to Spock. How do you like that? Um, so, <laughs> so I don't know if you guys, uh, I'm not a huge uh, sci-fi guy, but uh, I, I did watch a little bit of Star Trek growing up. Um, and I remember a famous character named Spock. And uh, if you're younger than 30 or 35, you may not remember Spock, but uh, he's a fictional character, uh, part of Star Trek, and he's a Vulcan. And a Vulcans don't feel emotion. And I just found this on a little chat log. I thought it was hilarious, but it says all Vulcans uh, experience emotion. However, their I ideology suppresses it. They are taught to suppress all emotion since emotion interferes with logic and judgment. Spock, however, has a tougher time doing so because of the fact that he's half human. Humans naturally experience emotion. And this is just such a great quote uh, from Spock uh, in one of the movies. It says, your highly emotional reaction is most illogical. <laughs> and that's what can happen when, 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 when humans uh, are emotional beings. And, and it, it, since your mind, a lot of times, especially when you get into that fear and worry, goes the absolute worst case. In our minds, we're thinking right now, oh, no, Great Depression, repeat, you know, and we got to sell. It's going to get way worse. And so we sell. But um, that, that a lot of times you don't take into effect all the logic and all the different factors that are out there. We're just being swarmed by a lot of different negative a negative feedback loop, whether it's from uh, not only mainstream media, but also social media and just everything that's going around, different stories you're hearing. So just want to kind of keep that in mind as we switch here to this next slide. What this is looking at is looking at uh, a study of fear. And I've shown, I've shown this a few times in the past. Of, um, fear is represented by the volatility index, which is at the bottom. This top part of the slide is the S&P 500. And so uh, you know, there's a famous quote by FDR, there's nothing to fear, but fear itself. Well, th what this looks at is all these red dots is where fear was at an extreme high. In fact, that when it was, uh, to be exact, when, it was, when the uh, VIX was above 36. So it was at an extreme high. People were really scared at that time. And so the red dots on the bottom are when people were really square, scared. And then on the top here, it's what, it's, it marks that spot on this chart. And, and to kind of sum all these numbers up, because I know it's a busy slide, that over the, since 1987, there has been 402 times uh, where we've reached this extreme level of fear, okay? And if you would have bought on all of those 402 times and waited one year, it would be positive 94% of the time, okay? And, and your average return would be 23%. One year later, if you would have bought when fear was at that extreme high. Let me state it in a different way. If you would have sold the, it, at those extreme fear times, like now, like 2008, like 2000, 2002, you would have only been right 6% of the time. And, and, and so and, and would have missed out on a significant win. So 378 times, uh, that would have, the market went up, which on average went up 25% when it went up. And then only 24 times was it down for an average loss of 12%. So I think that's such a powerful um, point to say that when people are scared, they tend to sell. And, and, but, but the smarter money or the more in the no money tends to buy during that time. But everything inside of you is telling you to sell. And, and it's a logical thought process, but it, it causes you to do something that may cost you a lot of money. A similar chart here, this is a measurement. It's the AA. 
AIII, which is a survey, it's uh, American uh, Association of Individual Investors. So basically your average investor or investments are a hobby. You're not, not professional investors. It's surveying just your average investor. And, when, and so when this line goes down, it's when they're very bearish or, or, or very few people think the market's going up. And when it goes up, a, a lot of people think the, the, the uh, when it gets really high, a lot of people think the market is going to go up. Uh, when it gets low, a lot of people think the market's going to go down. So basically what this is saying, when we reach an extreme level of people thinking that and feeling like the market's going to go down, um, if, if you would have bought that, basically we've got that, that has happened 34 times over the last uh, almost 30 plus years, 91% of the time, a year later, it would have been positive. And so with a 15% average return. So, um, you know, two, two slides that just really point to when you think things are going to be bad and when you get into an extreme time period of fear, like we're in now, both of those slides were in that, that extreme fear level. Um, usually a year later, a large percentage of the time, the market is higher. Am I saying the market's going to go straight up from here? No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, historically, the market tends to go up um, when we reach these extreme fears a high percentage of the time. So another one, another question we've been getting a lot recently is, how is the market going up when the economy is going down? It seems like it's going opposite directions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in, in, along those same lines, you know, unemployment's supposed to reach 25, 30%. It's supposed to get really high. How, how is the market going up? Or, or, the mar or I think the market's going to go down since we're going to have so much unemployment. Well, this is a super interesting slide, being a nerd like myself, because um, this goes back to 1980 on the top of the S&P 500. On the bottom is the unemployment rate. And you have these little vertical lines. The first vertical line is when the market bottoms. The second vertical line is when unemployment tops. Okay, so the point I'm making here is the market bottoms and starts going up prior to unemployment reaching its high. So that, that was the one that was back in 1982. This one's back in the recession of 91. You see the market bottomed over here. Unemployment kept going up for over a year later. And so this is 2002 after the tech bubble. The market bottomed right here. Unemployment kept going up for almost another year. This is 2000, March of 2009, the bottom of March 2009. Unemployment kept going up from about 8% all the way to 10% over the next six months or so. So every single time of the major drops in the last 30, 40 years, the market has bottomed prior to unemployment peaking, okay? And that's a critical piece. The market is a leading indicator. It's a forward-looking mechanism. It's looking at what is happening. It's anticipating what's gonna happen in the future. It already is, the market is already, when it goes down, it's already anticipating the economy to get bad. Now it's looking at it from the standpoint of when is it gonna start going up, okay? And this is just to, just to kind of point out um, some of the statistics behind that last one. Uh, on average, the market bottoms 11 months ahead of when, when the unemployment tops. And the average that the market ends up returning over those next 11 months is, is 26%. So, you know, most people wait for economic conditions to get better, you know, before they're comfortable investing again. Um, and by that time, the market's usually already gone up significantly. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm transitioning here. I, I, I wanted to throw some of those slides out to address some of the emotional side. And I don't have much time to talk because I'm trying to hold me to eight minutes here. But um, <laughs> what I want to touch on that I think one nugget that I think a lot of people that are participating in can, can really pay attention is how important your retirement account is. Okay. On average, for most people, your retirement account, whether it be your 401k, 403b, makes up one third of your net worth, okay? But most people have no idea what they're invested in in their 401k. And a lot of people never even made an investment election. And thank God, over the last 10 years, they've kind of transitioned in the 401k world where they have what's called a qualified default investment allocation, which it's a long way of saying, if you don't choose anything, we're going to choose something for you based off of your age. It's called a target date fund. So if you see the, you see that inside the fund that you hold in your 401k has like a 2030 or a 2040, it's, it's targeting the date that you will basically hit 65 or kind of the date that you retire. So, and, I've, and this is real life. I've, we've seen people, I've literally seen someone 
go go all cash, go into their money market um, in 2008 inside their 401k and forget about it. And 10 years later, mm. they're still in their money market in their 401k. That's a real life story. Um, and it's so, so critical that, that we pay attention to our 401k. You don't have to necessarily be an expert at, at picking your investments, but it, it, but, but it, it is important that you pay attention and either, you know, it's obviously, it's something that we do at All Gym. We help our clients with their 401k. We provide them an allocation. Um, but if you don't have a professional that can help you with that, you know, do some heavy research to, to try to find a, a good investment in your 401k. It's not as easy said as done. You have to be very diversified, but, but at least make sure you're invested and not in a money market um, where, where we've literally seen people like that. Um, the other piece is, you know, a lot of times people are in a target date fund. And if you don't know anything about investing, a target date fund is probably better than you trying to pick your own investments. Uh, because at least there's a professional managing that target date fund and the allocation is kind of based off of when you're going to retire. Um, but a lot of times that target date fund can take more risk than what you're comfortable with. We saw that a lot in 2008 when target date funds took mm. a huge drop. Um, and, and a lot of times if you allow a professional to come up with an allocation for you, you can achieve a slightly better return over the long haul. And in, 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 in when we've kind of studied what a target date fund could do versus what an allocation that we could um, you know, choose for them with the funds that they're allowed. Sometimes we've seen, a, you know, a, a small percentage difference in the positive. And if we just look at like a 1% difference, okay, so let's say you started off with $100,000 in your 401k and you contributed $10,000 a year into your 401k and, and you did that over 10, 20, 30, and 40 years, look at the difference between making 7% and making 8% over your working lifetime. So you're talking about 3.4 million versus 4.7 million. Mm. It's like a one point, you know, almost $1.3 million difference of making one additional percent. So a lot of people don't think 1% is a lot. Uh, but if you compound that over and over and over over time, it makes a huge difference in your 401k. So pay attention to that. It's one for a lot of people, it's their biggest asset. If not, it's their second biggest asset behind their house. Um, and, and it's very, very important over time. The other mistake we see a lot with this is someone leaves their job and, and their 401k, especially some of the older 401ks, they just never touch. And it just stays in that 401k. They never look at it and they never rebalance it. Um, and it's in some old investment. A lot of times it's in like an annuity type of framework where it's really heavy fees um, and it just really underperforms. It's, it, it, a lot of times it makes, it, it makes good sense um, to roll over your 401k into an IRA and allow that uh, and, and allow a professional to manage that for you to try to get a better return over the long run. So don't just allow those 401ks, to, those old 401ks to just sit out, uh, you know, just, and, not, and, and not pay attention to that. Those should be working for you hard because it needs that compounding over a long period of time to work well. If you haven't done so already, click here to subscribe. We frequently upload market update videos on the coronavirus, provide financial planning tips, and relevant personal finance topics on our channel.